In 1974, I took a leave of absence from Northeastern University and to go work in France for one year to get some math done, really. I had to get some papers out, and I wasn't getting enough done back here, so I took off. And also, at that point, I've been cycling on my own cycle touring for three years. I started in 71. And I saw there were clubs out on the road, and I found out there was a club I, I was living across the street, basically, from the University in Orsay, and I joined their athletic association, which is Association Sportive de la Faculté de l'Arc de Croix d'Orsay, as well, and they had a cycle touring section, and I paid like $15, actually, it was 30 francs, so same as CRW now. Uh, and they gave me a pile of maps when I went in and signed up. So we got, I have them with me still, these paper maps. You notice they have circuit numbers on them and a schedule of the Sunday rides because you're supposed to bring the circuit we were going to ride. You know, we all had all the maps and we said, okay, on this Sunday it's circuit 17. And we brought that one along. And um, just happened that the starting point was always the same except when we went on special things. It was about 100 meters from my bed, pretty nicely arranged. I just sort of roll across the street, and I went out my first Sunday and joined this club. I was the only woman, I was the only woman the entire year who rode with them. And just, uh, there were very few women riding at all in France, but they were delightful. They accepted me. In fact, I went out on Sunday, Tuesday morning, I got a call saying, oh, we're going on a rally north of Paris. Next Sunday, do you want to go? I'll pick you up at 6 a.m. You know, it was like that. So mostly we rode right in the neighborhood, and otherwise someone would come and pick me up, and we rode these nifty rides together. Gorgeous country, gorgeous, gorgeous places to ride. So then, one day in April, they said, okay, we're going on this special ride. It's 200 kilometers. You know, that's, you can do that. Well, I had Turin done that much once, exactly. I said, all right, you know, I'll join you. So we went on 200 kilometer brevet. Now, at this point, I knew absolutely nothing about brevets or paragraphs. Between. It was just like the other rides when we went on club rallies. We went out and did these 200 kilometers. It actually was awful. Um, <laughs> it was fun, but it was freezing rain, so they had ice dangling from their beards. I had a jacket down to my knees. I mean, a proper rain because. We had just my jersey from my club. <laughs> and, um, wool shorts with genuine shiny skin and linings. But I had a parka that really came to my knees that was that thick with ice and heavy. But the other thing was, this was the first time I think I did an all day thing with them and we had to stop for a five course lunch. <laughs> and then I, I think it must have been that their espresso machine was broken because we. We went across the street to get proper espresso before we finished, went out and finished the ride. But we did it. So that was my 200 kilometer brevity, and we got stamped in all these cafes. Then one later they said, oh, we're doing this 300 kilometer ride. I wasn't so sure about that, but I went. The fact was that we did it a week late. We did it a week late because we ran our own rally the actual week. So we had 500 people coming, we had to be there these 500 people were coming to ride our rally, Chance et Forêt, and a week late we left. We left from the regular starting point, so we actually rode 320 kilometers plus. So it was my first real 200 mile ride, because it was a little over 320 kilometers. And um, it was terribly windy, as it, I mean, this is the plateau near Paris, it's flat, except for they're going down when there were river valleys and back up again. There were fierce winds, but we stuck together, we had our Five course lunch somewhere, you know, we kept going. The real problem to me was there were two really slow riders. And we there were like twelve of us, I think. We just really made a point of regrouping at the top of hills, and we had to stand around and wait 15, 20 minutes for these two guys repeatedly. It meant I wasn't the slowest rider this time, but you know, it was painful. It just really hurt, and I thought this is not fun at all. So then they told me, okay, we're going to do a 400 kilometer. <laughs> and I said, a 
to go to work for a conference. I don't think I'll be there. So uh, I, I was happy. I really had no desire to do any more of this stuff. Uh, so, yeah. so, so to mention, I did write home from Warwick, and I rode 400 kilometers that weekend, but I slept a good night's sleep on the ferry between Southampton and La Havre, and I also brought a stack of pleasure racks on top of my rack because you couldn't get them in France, and everybody wanted them, so, you know, I, I got in my kilometers, but well, not in the rack. What did you bring? Pleasure racks, they were foldable racks that to put on the back uh -huh. on the wheel, and you couldn't get them in France. And I had one, and they all all wanted racks like mine. So I got a stack of them and strapped them to my rack and rode home with them. Um, so then they said, we're moving the 600 kilometer way. Now, why did I even think about doing this? Well, one of those two riders who was so slow did the 400, and they just leaned on me and said, you do the 400. You can do the 600. You can do this. I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. So we did. And uh, it was sort of fun. You know, it was painful. And so, oh, but I wrote it with uh, Bernard, who's on the left, and Claude, who's in the middle. And the three of us started out together, and we were really well the first day. We had a blast riding in with Count Thomas and talking to people. And that's me on the right. I said, see, we're in the same place. <laughs> and, um, you know, but we got tired. What happened is my back went, the spike. Someone said ligament, but I think it was muscle along the spine. Suddenly it got lumps and hurt like hell, and I could barely move, and I was slowing down, and they were tired too, so we said, okay, we've got to find a place to sleep. And that's what we found. <laughs> it wasn't that one in particular, but it looked much like that. And um, they decided we might separate the sexes, so they slept on this side and put me on this side. Unfortunately, the wind was coming this way. <laughs> and we got up three hours later, I could barely get up. I, mean, I could barely stand, and I sent them on their way. I said, you know, there's, I'm going to only slow them down. And I rode at that point, holding my back with my left hand, bolt upright, at five kilometers an hour max. Oh. I could barely move. There's no way I was going to get to the end. I was just hoping it was going to grow up if I kept this up. It was still very cold and, you know, still sort of night out. And I just kept moving. But, you know, we did have support on the road. And sure enough, the sad wagon came along and said, get in, you know, we'll just drive you home. But that's when I found out there was another rider still far behind me. And this was Jacques Lynch. He was the only person in our club who had ever ridden PVP. He'd ridden it in 71. But this year, he never came on club rides because he was working full time and doing masters at night. So I never met him. He decided he would do the six of he had barely ridden all year. I was doing the 600 kilometers to see if he could still do it. And so I said to the driver as well, as long as Jacques is still out there, I'm not the one keeping me out on the road. I'm just going to keep going. We'll decide when he catches up. So a little later, they came to me and said, he's two kilometers behind. I'm still going five kilometers an hour, holding my back in place. But right around then, the sun came out. The fog went away. And I, I found I could ride 15 to 20 kilometers an hour. Never got faster than that, but I could move, and I had a chance of getting to the end. So Jacques caught up with me, and we rode together, and it was absolutely painful. <laughs> <laughs> and Jacques and I, he insisted we stop literally every five kilometers for exactly two minutes and rest. And we've done this before, exactly two minutes, at which point my back went bananas, and I had to be the next three kilometers uh, painful. The last two, you know, started to loosen up. Now we had to stop again. Five kilometers had gone by. But we kept doing this. We rode 100 kilometers together, and we finally got to within 14 kilometers. The end, and he kept telling me to quit. And I wasn't any slower than he was, and I could well done without the two-minute rests. But he kept telling me to quit. Take the sandwich. You know, this was really making it easy to get there. We got 14 kilometers from the end, 
and you think, what could possibly stop you? Well, this is talking about Papua Little Bay, 14 kilometers of Pave. The last 14 kilometers on this side of Pave. And that was just a hell on my back. And yeah, he wasn't doing much better at this point. But we were getting through. I bless him because he knew the route, because by this time the paper signs had all blown away, and I wouldn't have even known how to get back if it wasn't for Jacques. But we kept going, and my bike died too. My free wheel gave up. And uh, I realized, I mean, I thought I was going to have to kick the bike, basically, and scoot it home. But I found if I pedaled backwards about two turns, it would latch, and I could go forward one, back two. We got there. We got there in 39 hours. It was a 40 hour limit. And indeed, I was got my name in the keep for being last. <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> so, also during this ride, they did not ask the organizers if I could do the Paris Press Paris, assuming I finished this, even though I hadn't done the 400 kilometer brevet, because at that time you had to do all of them, and I hadn't done that. And they said there were no rules for Americans. <laughs> I had done, I mean, two Americans had tried it this in 71 and not succeeded, and they, they had no rules for them. So, sure, it was fine with them if I finished. And now I had to face this. You know, I got to 600. Well, there was two months, and two months that's plenty of time for training. So, I, yeah, I'm going to ride hard. The problem was I had to go back to the States because I decided to spend another year in France and took another year's leave of absence. And I had to go visit my parents and deal with my landlord. And but I, you know, I had a bike here in the Boston area, and I went there. And uh, first thing was my person I sublet to fought with my landlord, and they said, "Nope, uh, he made me move out." So I had to pack up my apartment and commit for very little riding while I was there for three weeks. Then I had to visit my parents. They had no bike, and a neighbor lent me an old postman's bike that fell apart on me. And I got like a 215 mile, 125 mile ride, and carrying the chain guard back under my arm. Uh, and then I got back to France with two weeks to go. I put in one good week riding 100 to 200 kilometers every day. And then people advised me not to ride much the last week, but to save my energy. So I did only about 30 kilometers a day. And I got a new bottom bracket on my bike. I had to take the bike in, and I got my cleats hammered in. You know, the cleats we had then, you just slipped onto a ridge and pedal. We used to talk those, as you'll see. So uh, that was my training. I also tried to alter sleep, because we left four in the afternoon. I thought, well, I should sleep till noon or so. But the last day, the Asheville people decided we had to do breakfast together. So much for that. So it was like four hours short instead of a head on sleep. But I did it, and that's the route. I actually have this. This is really what I had in my TA bag on the front to follow uh, this way. <laughs> you know, it's how we did it. it it's also appears on private.gps on shinybrand.com. <laughs> so the start. This was the Asphalt crew. That was the group. This is, uh, you can see again, they're not here. I think this is Claude. Some of our other riders, some of our drivers. We had two vans going with us. One, there were two guys driving one and two women driving the other. And uh, those were some, some stuff they handed out. That was, we all had numbers on the bikes, and they gave us each a bottle. I still have it. Uh, and there was my carte de la route, which they wrote this very sort of English translation of the rules and, and what we're supposed to do. And of course, it got all this. And they made these little American flags for us. There's <laughs> 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 uh, hand drawn American flag there. Um, so, equipment. The bike I have back there, sort of, it had uh, some differences. You see that funny flashlight, uh, <laughs> actually, uh, and I have the holder in there. It's got a shorter flashlight on it now, but it plugged into the handlebar on the bike, and it had a three cell flashlight, and it was very flaky. <laughs> it was, you know, not great. <laughs> but 
it lit the road, and I had one of those leg lights too, and I had a handlebar bag on the back of the bike. So you know, that's the stuff I had. And I had, all right, in the bag, I had a rain cape, two soaps, because I had soaps at the time, that I was told I had to have soaps. So I was riding on soaps, and I had a rim tape, I had spare batteries and bulbs, which I went through. I had tools, a spoke wrench, free wheel, a free wheel remover, and a, we always carried a big adjustable wrench, because you had to do your own work if you were caught out on the road. Uh, I also had a little space blanket because the experience near the haystack said I might need that. So I want that more. Uh, I had glucose tablets. That was common. I mean, they give you a 20-minute high. I had some powder that's sort of like Gatorade. Um, Pot de fruit, which are little fruit jellies. A kilo of pearls, which I ate all the first day. Same effect on the third day. Chicken. <laughs> 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 myself. So that went along. I also had on the back, so a warm up suit. I had spare spokes, I guess, tape to stay. And we had to put three on reflective tape that's still on my cranks. And we have fenders, which I don't have on now. You can see the other bikes. Fenders were required. Um, and then in one of the vans, I had two more sew ups, some spare cycling clothes. Uh, and panties, because I hadn't yet learned that you weren't supposed to wear them, with your chamois shorts, ouch. And I had a hairbrush, toothbrush, etc. that was never in the right van. So I never got close to those things. Um, at the start, well, we went up front. What happened is we got there, and for the sake of the drivers, they told us they wanted us to ride in pairs. There were eight people from our club. So, Claude and Bernard were going to ride together, and I was to ride with Jacques. And I just about died when they told me that. I knew there was not a chance I'd make it to the end. But then, bless the organizers, they decided that the tandems, tricycles, and women should start 15 minutes early, which counted against their times. But they wanted to show the world that there were such oddities as tandems, <laughs> tricycles, and women. <laughs> so I just, I got the chance. <laughs> and I went out. Now, Bevanar walked me up and introduced me to these two women who bring the 600 with us and said I should ride with them. So, you know, I'm company. And I figured they had to be stronger than me. Everybody was. I was last, you know. But it was. Not quite as bad a shock, but they refused to move. They just kept saying, no, you have to take your repose now. You have to take it easy. Later, it's time to work harder. And within five minutes, we were off the back of this early starting group. And I just said, well, the pelotons will eventually start passing, we'll move out. They refused. And I know that uh, Annette, Catherine, a young 18-year-old woman from California, started with the main pack, and we chatted a bit. And then finally, there were some pelotons at a speed I felt I could join, and I just moved in with them. And I always rotated to my turn off run. It was a blast. That was really the fun of PP, was chatting with people all the way. And that's where speaking some French really helped. Um, so from Longy, when I got to Longy, though, I guess that was the first Longy pouch, was the first control. and. Uh, I got there way earlier than they expected me to. They tried to persuade me to wait for Bernard, and I guess I waited but like 20 minutes, and then he had to leave. So I suggested that I go on, because I was the slower rider, and I started out. And it, this is where I really remember meeting some people I met. First person, as I was alone, in the dark, riding against the wind. There's no one. I mean, we had 666 cyclists start, but no one was on the road in front of me. And I saw one guy clutching his leg off the side of the road, so I stopped to see if he needed help. He was surprised. He just he had a bad cramp and was waiting for a sad wagon. But I showed him how to get rid of the cramp by bending his toes toward his knee and made him start riding with me. Uh, the road slowly, and he told me to go on because he felt he was slowing me down. So I went on alone in the dark against the wind. And I saw another rider actually moving, so I, I sped up as fast as I could to catch up to him. And I pulled up alongside him, not behind him, and he immediately stopped, got off his bike. 
I said, what's wrong? He said, there's no way I'm going to work this hard only to have a woman on my wheel. <laughs> <laughs> I said, he said he was going to wait for a passing peloton. I said, well, there's no way I was going to stand around and get stiff while I waited for a passing peloton. So I was going to ride. He was welcome to ride on my wheel, but if we rode in relay, we could probably make good time before the peloton caught up. And we rode like hell. I'm not sure I've ever ridden that fast again. We just took 20, 20 turns of pedals, rotating, all alternating, taking the wind, because it's the best way to move. And so we got to Penn, oh, just three and a half, way, way fast. I mean, and the last thing he said to me was he never believed a woman could ride that fast. And we went off. I had, we had one of our bands there. And the trouble was I shouldn't have ridden that fast. Because now my left quad was like my back was so the 600 and there was only 350 kilometers into this ride. And it was painful. And they tried to massage it out. Uh, but it didn't. And again, I could move, I could move at a reasonable pace when I started, it just remained painful. So I left there, I started on the clothes had passed, and um, they told me that they at some point they were at a restaurant eating and I managed to catch up to them and have a quick lunch because they were faster and we hit the road together and we got up to Gangol together where there was a van waiting for us to sleep and the plan was to sleep for three hours. After an hour with no sleep they decided to leave and I wasn't up to it. I hadn't slept either but I told them to wake me in two more hours and uh, the road is planned and I woke up six hours and 20 minutes later <laughs> they didn't set an alarm. And uh, they also insisted they hit my bike until I had a hot breakfast. So I left there eight hours and 45 minutes after I arrived. And I didn't even think I could make it to the next control. But I did. Got there before it closed, and I kept going. So I went on to Brest. And on the way to Brest, you know, I remember Morley. That's the one side I remember. The aqueduct in Morley is really pretty. But all of a sudden, and I'm riding along, that's me riding, I'm going to Lombard. All of a sudden there's bright light sirens, people screaming at me in French to get off the road. I really thought I was being arrested. Yeah. And, you know, it's really scary. And, I, and what they were doing was the secret control. <laughs> <laughs> and then they sent me on. Everything's fine. <laughs> and, uh, I'm I don't remember the second secret. Well, I guess by the time you've been through one of these, you know, you still don't know. So I got to Brest, and uh, the main thing at Brest was they had no food left. There was supposed to be food in that control to give to the riders. There was nothing left. I, I had a little chicken left on my chicken, and I finished it in the bones way. It was more space in my back. And not, you know, I was really hungry. But I started back to get a goal, and uh, was heading back to get a goal knowing they would have soup. And I got 10 minutes from Dan Holt when first flat. So so absurd pretty fast. Anyway, to change and an old woman ran out to watch me change it. I got on a new tire, I got my hot soup. And I think at this point is when they asked me to ride with Bernard that he was, you know, so I waited again for him to catch up and we rode together. Um, those pictures of us riding at night. And we really we rode the rest of the way together, and I, he, uh, I mean, a few things happened. It, one was his light broke. We spent an hour in Lombal fixing his light. It was a little delay. He was, I thought, at that point, definitely in better shape than I was because of my thigh was still hurting. But I figured he cost me enough time. It was okay. And we we kept riding, and then, um, well, a miracle happened. 600 kilometers after I hurt my thigh, the lumps went away and the pain went away. So now I know how to get rid of those lumps of things. Just keep riding. And at that point, I really felt strong and we just took turns riding. Uh, the other thing was that we got in a cold rain. We got soaked to the skin, we were just chattering. And we also had a van with us. Now, the reason we had the van is quite sad. The policy was that if you were the last stretch between Amouye and the end at night to have a, and you had a car on the road, they should stay with you because of the traffic. 
But word came up that two riders had been hit, and one had been killed, and another mm -hmm. paralyzed. And they asked that if you had a vehicle on the road to ride with you, that they stay with you as soon as it went dark. Mm -hmm. So that's why we had one of our vans with us. And it was also lucky because it's when I got my fifth flat. I had four, so I was, thought there was a spare wheel in the van. Mm -hmm. So I managed to get a spare wheel at that point. Um, we also we stopped in the station at Rambouillet and put on dry clothes, which happened to be in that van. And now we're on home territory, and we rode together to the end. And I gotta say, I'm pretty sure that was Bernard at the end, uh, looking like he just made it. And yeah, we did it. It was 88 hours and 40 minutes. I probably got more sleep than anyone else. Um, and was happy. So there's just some stats that your 666 cycle started only 21 more women, and they called it La Nuit Feminine. There were so many women. You know, 107, I guess, dropped out, so, and 13 women, including two riding tandem, uh, actually finished, and four Americans. There were, yeah, as I said, eight Americans started. They told me 16 signed up, but only eight showed up at the starting line. Four of us made it to the end. And actually another, uh, kind of ski, yes, uh, we rode with him a little bit that third night when Bernard and I were riding together. Um, and he had not slept in three days at all. And I was quite sure he was going to end up at the side of the road, so I gave him my space blanket. And he did make it back but after the 90 hours. So, sort of fifth American, almost made it. Well, that was it. And uh, it was just totally memorable to me. And I guess one other little bit. The following spring, when we were at a rally north of Paris, a guy ran up to me and gave me two kisses and said, Thank you. It's the guy with the crown. Oh. 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 <laughs> oh. Oh. So that was what we needed. So that's it. Yes.